even better. Morning, wow. This is a very flashy stage, but you know, my stage, which is just over there, is a geodesic dome, and it feels very eco and circular and beautiful, so if you do want to spend some time there, that would be great. Uh, now, economics uh, often has a bit of a bad rap. Uh, it's called the, the dismal science. Uh, I have uh, today with us uh, four amazing economists, and I looked up the collective noun for an economist. You know, what was it? Was it a herd or a pride? It's all rather negative. It's a deficit of economists or a recession of economists. But as I said, our economists are far from that. And so we're inventing a new collective term, certainly for this four, which is a moonshot of economists. Uh, I'm going to introduce them each uh, one at a time, uh, and we'll take a seat there, and then they'll each have an eight-minute session uh, to present, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion. Um, so we will kick off. I'm very excited to... Can I see her? Is she there? She's there. Great. I'm so excited to have Kate Rayworth here. Uh, Kate is uh, affiliated to the University of Oxford, but more importantly, she launched the movement Donut uh, Economics, uh, which is truly groundbreaking. Kate, please come up on the stage. And then next up, uh, we have uh, another fearless uh, economist, best known for her work in helping us understand the r true nature of entrepreneurship and the role of the state and what the state can do to actively help us solve these problems. Award-winning Professor of Innovation and Public Policy at UCL, Mariana Mazzucato. Nice to see you. Oh, we're good. Oh, we're good. Uh, and then up next, uh, 40 years as a venture capitalist and now redeeming himself as an academic and an author, uh, brilliant thinker, uh, a great uh, supporter of the University of Cambridge, Bill Janeway. I understand we're only allowed to shake hands. Yeah, great. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, all the way from New York, uh, the head of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Jeff? Nice to see you. Thank you. Good. So we'll kick off, I think, with, uh, with Kate. Uh, you have eight minutes. Would you like to stand up? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Azim, and it's a huge pleasure to be here today. I am going to kick off. I'm going to introduce you to the one donut that actually turns out to be good for us. Because we may have some incredible tools this century. Oh, it's not clicking. There we go. We may have some incredible technologies, but what we need more than anything is a compass. We need to know where the hell we're going. And I offer you this as a very clear compass of where we need to go. So let me explain it to you. Imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture. So that hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. It's where people don't have the resources they need for food, and water, healthcare, housing, energy, communications, gender equality, political voice. I crowdsourced these from the Sustainable Development Goals, which were being discussed in the last session. So the world's governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these essential needs. No one should be left in that hole, but get over a social foundation of resource use. But, and this is a very big 21st century but, we now know that as we collectively use Earth's resources, there is a critical limit of pressure we can put upon this planet before we kick our planetary home out of balance. We cannot go over that ecological ceiling because there we cause climate breakdown. We acidify the oceans. We create a hole in the ozone layer. We destroy ecosystems. These are the nine planetary boundaries at the leading edge of Earth system science created a decade ago by scientists who believe these are the nine critical life-supporting systems of our planet that make Earth such a unique, delicately balanced living planet that supports humanity. So the goal is to meet the needs of all people, leave no one in the hole, without overshooting the means of the planet. It's to find a balance between those two boundaries. At a very, very different shape of progress from the 20th century that became obsessed 
with GDP growth which would rise and rise forever and ever. I believe fundamentally in the 21st century we're going to realize that well-being lies not in endless growth, it lies in balance. We know it in the health of our own bodies and now we need to find it in our planet, in our communities and indeed we need to design our economies to be compatible with that. So this is the goal. And of course the question is where are we? And that's where we are. All the red shows you the extent to which people in the world are falling short on the essentials of life. 13% of people don't have enough food to eat every day. One person in three worldwide doesn't have access to what we call a toilet. But on every one of those social dimensions, there are millions, billions of people falling short right now. And yet we have already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries. We're way over on greenhouse gas emissions. We're way over on biodiversity loss, on land use change, on excessive fertilizer use. If looking at a diagram doesn't bring it home for you, let me bring it home in some headlines that once seemed like imagination from a dystopian future, but I just found them in the newspapers recently. The UN tells us we have 12 years to turn around our relationship with climate breakdown. You won't have missed last year, WWF said that since 1970, that's the year I was born, I will save you the maths, I'm 48, since 1970, the population of all species other than humans has fallen by 60%, while our population has doubled. We have plastics in human bodies across the world. Air pollution, land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution, ocean acidification to hit levels not seen in 14 million years. And the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. I challenge you to actually try and get your head around what that means. If you need one little piece of good news, I love this headline, NASA. Hole in Earth's ozone layer finally closing up because humans did something about it. And the good news is we can do something about all of this because all of this is a result of human activity and the design of our economies. We need to turn this around. In the words of the US writer William S. Burroughs, after taking one look at planet Earth, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. And we wonder who that is, and whether it's a person or whether it will become an algorithm. So here are my conditions for meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. Number one, this is our moonshot. Of course, in the 21st century, the moonshot is Earth and her people. That's as far as we need to look for an extraordinary achievement. That is our collective goal. Second to AI, I say if AI is not in service of this, what the hell is it doing? Because we need to put the best of all our creativity and our technologies in service of this. Otherwise, we destroy ourselves. Thirdly, what kind of dynamics do we need to bring about in our economy? This is the sign of an economy that is degenerative and divisive by design. And this, I think, is what we have to turn around. Let me show you. We have economies that are degenerative by design. A hose pipe is a damn useful thing. I recommend you carry one everywhere. We have economies that take Earth's materials, we stuff them in the pipe of production, we use them for a while, often only once, and then we throw it away. This take, make, use, lose, this is what is pushing us over the Earth's planetary boundaries and running down the living systems on which we utterly depend. We have to bend that arrow around and create a circular, a cyclical economy, a regenerative one where resources aren't used up, they're used again and again and again. An economy that runs on sunlight will look up, not down, for energy this century. So I ask, what is AI doing in service of regenerative design and making that possible? And what's the role of the state in making it truly an ecosystem of circularity, not just siloed companies doing their own little bit? But secondly, we have an economy that is divisive by design, that drives the returns of activity to the hands of the 1%. We've inherited technologies like fossil fuel technologies, an oil rig that drives capital into one big piece of equipment intellectual property rights that hold the returns in the hands of the patent holder. We've had industries that bring workers into a big factory and merely get a wage. This is an incredible opportunity because in the 21st century, for the first time in human history, we have technologies that are asking not to be centralizing and therefore divisive by design. They are distributive by design. 
We can put a solar panel on the roof of every home, every school, hospital, business. We can have distributed energy right where we stand. We've got no longer dependence on big factories. We've got desktop 3D printing. We can distribute enterprise and manufacturing and remanufacturing and refurbishing every village and town in the world. We've got a distributed network of communications. You've all got a node of the distributed network in your pocket, as have people in villages in Tanzania. And instead of relying only on patents and copyrights, where I control the IP, we've got Creative Commons and open source software. And to me, this is the design opportunity. Again, I ask, in what way is AI going to be in service of a far more distributive economy? And what are governments going to do to make sure that that distributive economy actually serves all the people. Thank you. Hello, I had to steal Azim's phone because I've lost my phone. So if you see an iPhone anywhere that I was going to use as a stopwatch, bring it up here on stage while... Sorry? <gasps> oh my God, this is amazing! <laughs> This is the most useful conference I've ever been to. <laughs> this has just put me in a good mood. I was in a really bad mood up until now because I just got off a plane. Okay, George, I've just sent George to look for my phone. I have it. I think he's out there somewhere. This is amazing. Thank you. Wow, I'm done. <laughs> 30 of my seconds are over. Right, so clicker. Um, now, this is going to be a bit embarrassing because my eight minutes are distributed between three things I've said recently, said and reset and reset. Um, the first is what I wrote about in the entrepreneurial state, which is to get any sort of revolution, whether it was the IT revolution or the green revolution, we really need to understand the dynamics of investment, both in terms of the patient, long-term, mission-oriented investments that governments have provided in getting us basically everything in our iPhones, but also what that means for crowding in, actually getting the business sector excited to follow, to follow that lead. Second, this is actually also about rethinking value propositions. It's extraordinary how easy it was for Lloyd Blankfein after the financial crisis to say, to, to say that Goldman Sachs workers were the most productive in the world, this very kind of confident way that the financial sector deems itself to be wealth creating and the really problematic way that we think about value, which means that that same level of confidence, but also accounting mechanisms, how do we account for value creation much harder to do not only in the civil service, but also in the third sector. And if we are going to get ourselves a green revolution, we absolutely need that value creation to be understood as a collective endeavor. And third, and this is probably the most important thing, um, actually writing something that turns into law, I was actually given the uh, opportunity to work recently with Carlos Modas, who's the research commissioner in the European Commission, to write a report which uh, reflected on some of these lessons for the Commission's research financing, and I called it the Missions Report. And the idea is really to stop kind of just dispersing funds. And here I'm talking specifically in Europe, there's 100 billion euros being spent in innovation. Instead of thinking about it in a sectoral way or even in a firm size kind of way, you know, fund the SMEs, what would it look like to really galvanize that kind of research funding to be mission-oriented, as bold as going to the moon and back again and getting all the different sectors uh, to uh, work together to actually solve a mission, but also really to transform the instruments that government has from procurement to prize schemes, to grants and loans, to fuel the bottom-up experimentation. And of course, I'll be talking about climate missions. Um, so in my remaining five and a half minutes, let me just kind of go through some of these ideas. First, I already mentioned this issue of the iPhone. It's not just that there was public funding and everything that makes the iPhone smart and not stupid, internet, GPS, touchscreen, and Siri, but there was organizations. There was actually organizational capacity to do that. We really need to reflect on this because unfortunately, even though we talk about climate change and the need for a green revolution and the Green New Deal, if at the same time we're actually outsourcing the capacity of government institutions, we're not going to get there because in the same way that we need the private sector to think out of the box and do what Steve Jobs said, to be hungry and foolish, if you want to be innovative, we also need that kind of level of capacity and structure within the public sector. And unfortunately, these kinds of organizations, the DARPA 
Coca-Colas of this world have actually seen their funding, not just cut, but sometimes their missions themselves being diminished. And this is not unrelated to the way that we sometimes hype up the community in this room. Um, and perhaps we can get to some of that in the discussion later. When I mentioned finance, it's really important to understand that there's financial ecosystems. There's never been a lack of finance. There's this word, you know, the, the credit crunch or the financing gap. We need more finance for green. Not really. There's plenty of finance out there, even for green. It's often the wrong kind of finance. For example, venture capital. How many of you are venture capitalists? Let me see. Oh, good. Not too many. Um, and, you know, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, VC is important, but it's often exit driven. They want to exit in three or five years through a buyout or an IPO. That can get you from gadget A to gadget B. It doesn't get you biotech, nanotech, and it surely doesn't get you green tech, which really requires that patient, long term committed finance. In fact, if you look at the history of VC, they have more or less followed that kind of patient finance provided by other actors. And actually, there are increasingly, I should say, also some long term VC investors. But this graph here just looks at the difference, for example, between private VC funding and uh, public kind of VC funding, which is done through the U.S. Uh, Small Business Innovation Research Program. And it's not a surprise that even in an advanced industrialized country like the U.S., this kind of funding remains very important. And literally, if you look at the wave, this looks like a wave, beautifully, wave of um, investment, for example, that the National Institutes of Health have made in um, driving, really, the innovation in the pharmaceutical industry, something like 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating actually trace their research to this, the VC industry sort of came in halfway through, which is all fine, but then do we actually have value propositions and ways to talk about this long-term patient high-risk finance that governments need to take in order to get that kind of innovation. And this is also very important because it's not enough just to finance innovation. You should also be really rethinking and redefining the market. I often, uh, in fact, I was just literally at the NIH four days ago speaking to them about why is it that they're really just funding drugs? Why not lifestyle changes? And one of the roles of public finance should be to redefine what markets are, to really, to really co-create and co-shape them, not just to fill the, the gaps. Um, and if we look at uh, the renewable sector, and of course green should never just mean renewables, we really should be thinking about everything, including changing our lifestyles and what that means for nutrition, transport, etc. But what's interesting, again, is that there's lots of different financial institutions, but really understanding what it means for the division of innovative labor between those types of financial institutions, we, we should really understand the lessons from the IT uh, sector, the information communication technology sector. So this upper right-hand quadrant of high capital intensity, high risk, high uncertainty continues actually to be mainly uh, filled up by different types of public actors, whether it's the ARPA ease of this world, or also increasingly for the diffusion and deployment of green innovation by state banks, whether it's the KFW in Germany or the European Investment Bank. And really their role should be to crowd in, to bring in through their investments, other types of actors. And this only can happen, though, if they're ambitious, what I call mission-oriented. This is an interesting graph which shows really what should be happening, which is that you fund something in the beginning to really get it going, private sector comes in, and then potentially you can get out and fund the next big wave. You see this difference here between uh, wind and marine. And what's also really interesting, if you look around the world, there's different distributions between direct and indirect financing that the public sector provides to business R&D. And the lesson here, really, this blue, the, the dark blue ones are the direct, is that you can only really get the business sector to, to be interested in financing stuff once there's actually something out there that they can increase their expectations of future growth in that area. Over-reliance in so many countries on tax incentives simply increases profits. It doesn't increase that reinvestment of capital into the economy. And in case you don't know, the profit share worldwide right now is at record levels. There's no profits problem. What we really need to better understand is what kind of ambitious policies can get these uh, profits to get reinvested. Um, and in fact, well, I'm not going to go into that. Let me just get quickly to the point about the missions. What this mission-oriented framework is about is really thinking clearly about what it, what it really means about having that co-investment and collective value creation around missions, where missions are much more concrete than just challenges, and that then really fuel that dynamic cross-sector, cross-actor, cross-disciplinary investment that you need to solve a problem, and then fundamentally reforming existing instruments that are often static into being dynamic instruments that fuel bottom-up experimentation to, so multiple solutions to solve a problem, like getting the plastic out of the ocean. This is a huge opportunity. This isn't just about increasing money, but transforming the static, two linear uh, instruments that today are actually often um, 
stifling innovation. If you're interested in this, this uh, report is free on the web. It's called the Mission-Oriented Approach to Innovation in the EC. Um, and just lastly, in the UK government, we've recently, through a commission that I co-chair with David Willits, um, thought about what does this actually mean for industrial strategy. Industrial strategy is too often just a list of sectors which get money from governments. What does it mean to really focus on all the different sectors and how they can be uh, helping governments to solve problems and make that conditional? So instead of just handouts, instead of picking the winners, you pick the willing. Who's actually willing to engage with these fundamental uh, problems that governments have? Thank you. Well, as um, a couple of smart guys used to say who came out of Cambridge, now for something completely different. A little slower, but of, I hope as thoughtful as Mariana's distinctive take on the role of the state and the need for long-term capital. But I want to start in a different place. I want to start with where we are in the digital revolution, how it has reached a stage of maturity. It's now 50 years plus since the invention of the microprocessor, since the very first wireless telephony, since digital became the context, the potential context in which this time, not for the first time, the world was going to be reinvented. We did it with steam power. We did it with electrification. We've been doing it with the digital revolution for the last two quarters. Now, the ongoing extension of that revolution to pervade globally virtually all aspects of human life has been receiving for the last 10 years an extraordinary subsidy, effectively an unprecedented subsidy in the way of zero to negative real risk-free rates of interest. This is the context which has enabled the potential disruptors the unicorns, to pay their bills by selling securities rather than by selling enough goods and services in order to be able not to go broke. So one question that we're going to come back to, I will come back to briefly, is are they actually going to learn, have to learn how to pay their bills, and what would be the conditions in which this unique environment of zero to negative real risk-free interest rates disappears. But in the meantime, in the meantime, over these same 10 years, we've been experiencing a great uh, reversal, a great reversal in the relationship between the state and the digital revolution that it spawned. That revolution has matured indeed to the stage where it's attacking the authority of the state at multiple levels, from global to national to regional to local, and along multiple dimensions. And even, as we know in this country, I guess especially in the English-speaking world, it has served to undermine the integrity of the political process on which the authority of the state ultimately resides. Once again, it has enabled the second great globalization of the world economy. The first was enabled by steamships, telegraphy, telephony. This time it's been IT. The frictions involved in moving goods and services, capital and work, have been reduced asymptotically towards zero. And the flows that have resulted have overwhelmed the capacity of governments, especially those rooted in a concept of representative democracy to buffer their constituents from the, from the consequences. And one of those consequences, of course, particularly, again, in the Anglo-American English-speaking world, was the extraordinary, extreme financialization of the economy, financial assets overwhelming the underlying cash flows and producing the global financial crisis. This, in turn, reflected another factor that was going on, again, distinctively 
in the Anglo-American world. And that was the delegitimization of the state as an economic actor. Talk about a deficit of economists, those economists who most deeply were committed to the competitive market as the solution for all problems, of course, all had tenured professorships at major universities. That delegitimization of the state, in turn, limited, restricted, and allowed governments around the world to get stuck in an austerity trap post the global financial crisis after the immediate shock impact and the floor having been put under the crisis, the opportunities for mobilizing resources, again, at the kind of scale necessary to end this period of zero risk-free real interest rates. That has been stalled. Now, we all know what the mission that governments need to seek in order to escape from the austerity trap. We all know what it is. It's green. Once upon a time, we would have invoked the language of war, but that language has been debased from Vietnam to Iraq by way of the never-ending, or perhaps finally concluding, war on drugs. But the, the Green Revolution is not going to be able to succeed without active U.S. participation. Back before 2016, we had some reason to believe that slowly but persistently the U.S. was turning around and taking seriously the challenge and the opportunity. We're stuck for another two years. That's unquestionably the case. There is a new hope. Public opinion has definitely shifted. It is possible that the Democratic Party will find its shared mission in the Green Revolution. It is possible that we will find the kind of motivating mission that can re-legitimize the role which I entirely agree with Mariana and with our, with our great shared friend Carlotta Perez is essential to dealing with breaking beyond the digital revolution to be able to put it to work productively and address that donut-shaped economy that we need so urgently to address today. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. There's a big mess. Uh, what do we do about it? Um, and I think the uh, starting point is, yikes. I think the starting, I think the starting point is the answer to the question, uh, who's uh, the management here? There is no global manager and there is uh, nobody in charge. So. The problem that we face is how to get coordinated action in a highly diverse world with 193 countries and with huge divisions and yet a rather high urgency of action. And there is no completely satisfactory answer to that question to be sure. The only hope that I personally see is that we follow through on the slender read that we have where we have agreed globally to do certain things together. This is the best we can do in global cooperation is actually to take seriously our global commitments and try to realize them. We have two right now that are really our best hope. They're not an overwhelming hope, but they are our best hope. The first is the Paris Climate Agreement. It's an actual legal agreement among 196 signatories. All 193 UN member states have signed on. It took 23 years after the signing of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to come to the Paris Climate Agreement. It is now four years old. It is not being implemented. And the dolt of the US president, Mr. Trump, wants to pull out of it. 
that's about as fragile as we're going to get in this world. There is no time and no reality of negotiating something else. There is the chance of implementing what we have agreed or not succeeding. So my own modest addition to this is that we should take seriously these global commitments because they're the only thing we're going to have. The other of this character, of course, are the Sustainable Development Goals. Agreed in September 2015, they are a perfectly fine agenda. They are well posed, they are quantified, they are bold but achievable, they're desirable. There's nothing wrong with them, except again, we're not achieving them. And so I watched closely the process of reaching those agreements. They are the only agreements we're going to have this generation. We'll live or we'll die on them. Either we honor them or we fail. So far, we're failing. Just to be clear, we're not implementing either of them. And there's a lot of product differentiation around. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? All of those ideas are fine. But if we can't do what we've agreed to do, we're not going to do collectively what we haven't agreed to do either. So I would personally suggest simplifying the clutter a bit and trying to actually achieve what we have agreed to do. If you take those goals seriously, then the first step actually is analytical. What would it take to achieve X? What would it take to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement? What would it take to achieve SDG 3, universal health coverage, or SDG 4, universal access to education, and so on? That's an analytical question. The basic answer to those questions, indeed, are investments, targeted, directed investments that meet the criteria of transformation embedded in those goals. Much of those investments are public investments. They have to come out of budgets. Part are private investments, though private investments that are not going to occur under the current regulatory and tax environment because it's not incentivizing those investments. That's why we have these agreements, because we need them in order to reorient the direction of investments. Much of those investments have to come out of a common pot, not a profit-oriented solution, but actually budget grant financing. In other words, our tax revenues. Because many of these investments don't have a market return, or they are to provide services for poor people who don't finance these services out of their own purchases. So they're either redistributive or inherently non-market in character. I make this point because the biggest thing standing in the way of all of this is that we don't mobilize the resources that we need in actual, actually to make the investments to carry out what we have agreed to do. The US moonshot, which has been referred to a couple of times, cost about a half a percent of GDP per year in the 1960s. Even a little bit, almost 1% of GDP in the heavy years of the Apollo mission. In today's dollars, that would be about 150 to $200 billion per year effort. Manageable, but not insignificant. Our problem is our governments don't spend that money they don't spend that money because at the same time we're talking about all of these high objectives, we're cutting taxes or closing our eyes to the tax loopholes, which allow the rich to get richer and allow the companies to rake in 
the high returns and allow Mr. Bezos to have his $160 billion in his bank account while he goes about busting unions and evading taxes and parking money in offshore accounts and so forth. So the problem is we have a game underway. The game is once in a while state high objectives and then systematically ignore them because the game is really a game of the rigged and the rich to a large extent. So it's not too hard to figure out what we would need to do to find our way. It's analytically fairly evident, actually, when you think about it. And I think we've heard that very clearly from the excellent presentations. The problem is one of politics and the race to the bottom in the international scene, the race to the bottom within Europe, and the fact that our politics now, because it's really money-driven, is producing the worst of the worst in the outcomes. You're engaged in this country in the most tragic and absurd diversion of uh, human thought that this country has experienced in a long time. If you get uh, Boris Johnson, forget about it for years to come. I can tell you we have Donald Trump. He is the most mentally unstable, psychopathic leader we've ever had in American history. So we don't think for two minutes about any of this stuff. He did what he was told to do. He got the tax cuts through. And at the behest of the oil industry, he wants to pull us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And he's personally psychopathic on top of it. So it's all a bit of a mess. So what I suggest right-thinking people do is at least let's keep our eye on the stuff we've agreed to. Please do your part. Don't let Boris become prime minister. We'll do our part to get rid of Donald Trump. Ele electrifying. I will. I I know you talked about the war on drugs, uh, Jeff. I didn't realize you were actually going to talk about the Tory leadership uh, <laughs> as well. I thought that had been covered uh, already. But Bill, you've got a mic. Why don't well, you I, jump I, in? I, I just want to stipulate that when I made a, a sidebar reference to tenured professors of economics, first of <laughs> all, I absolutely was not referring to Jeff Sachs, who certainly is not a delegitimizer of government and, and champion of the unrestrained, unrestricted free market. And I think, frankly, he speaks for an awful lot of us who have accents such as mine in what he just had to say. Thank you. So we do, we do have the good, go good guys and the moonshots. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think has uh, come across in the four discussions has been a mismatch between the, uh, the power of the state and the power of the corporation, and the corporation as representative of, of the market. So I'm curious from a, maybe a generative perspective, um, how might we go about rebalancing that, or perhaps we, we don't need to? Maybe Kate would like to, or oh, Mariana, would, would, she's writing Mariana, please. <laughs> um, it depends what you mean by power. So there's huge power in terms of the financing, right? I mean, Elon Musk got five billion, <laughs> that's nine zeros in case people forgot, um, from the US government. So it's, you know, if you look at the power of the finance, it's actually almost just as large, public and private, and in fact, as I was saying, the public side is often taking these larger risks. What we have is a, is a crisis of narrative of discourse, what I call value. You know, Plato said storytellers rule the world. And these stories were telling about the role of the state, which first of all completely dismissed the history that both Bill and I have written about, are really toxic. And so when we actually need to catalyze and galvanize this real collective uh, investment process in order to solve these SDGs, it's really hard to do if one side is seen as just de-risking the risk takers, enabling, facilitating, at best correcting market failures. We really do need a framework. And it's not that theory matters and without a great theory we can't do stuff, but there's a real kind of correlation between the two. In sociology they call it performativity, how you actually talk about something actually then starts to 
to affect how that something acts. And I think we need to debunk these myths. And I do think there is some responsibility in the tech community of propagating some of the myths of what you know the garage tinkers, the entrepreneurs are doing. They wouldn't exist without these public funds that we're saying have to kick in. But now we have the, the need to react to what we've enabled. Yeah. And you know, history does, is, is a useful uh, source of metaphors as well as experience. 120 years ago, in the first Gilded Age in America, there, the giant companies of that time, the Standard Oils, the railroads, were at least as powerful, at least, and, and, and the government, the state in those days represented order of magnitude 1% of the national economy. Even in the US, it's 35%, and obviously greater. There was available a reservoir of outrage populist outrage, which then got effectively channeled by a set of politicians of whom the most well-known and most best remembered was Theodore Roosevelt, but he was by no means the only one, which produced a counterweight, an effective counterweight. We called it the antitrust laws in the US, but think of it as competition policy. Now, if you look around today, you clearly can see, if you like, the green shoots of a political response mm -hmm. to the enormous power of the digital giants. Some of it is undoubtedly going to be misapplied, contradictory, uh, and in some ways um, utterly inconsistent. But once that gets flowing, I think the, new, the real challenge today is for political leaders who can channel the populist outrage, not like Boris Johnson, uh, but into productive and constructive responses to make sense, to bring some coherence to the digital chaos that we're living with. Kate, I think you have something probably to say on that score, given your work on what we do about filling in that hole in the donut economy. Uh, I just wanted, uh, to Jeff's point, the trouble with the next prime minister is that only members of the Conservative Party have a say in who our next Prime Minister is. So can I redouble? If you're a member of the Conservative Party, your responsibility in this room is just redoubled in response to Jeff's point. Um, here, here. I, 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 the point I was making about going from centralizing to distributive technologies, to me this is such an extraordinary opportunity, and I just want to illustrate it here. 20th century oil rig coal mine, 21st century energy, right here in this little wallet. I have a solar panel. Right? It's, it's phenomenal how, how, we, how we generate the goods and services we want. The technologies are changing. And in 10 years' time, this will look clunky. But what matters most is not, to me, not the design of the technologies. It's the design of the enterprises that manage them and choose to what purpose they're put. And for me, I use a lens upon every enterprise, be it a corporation, a, a social enterprise startup, five design traits of enterprise. What is its purpose? What is it, or in networks, what are the networks it moves in? Who its customers, suppliers, its allies, the progressive uh, alliances it becomes part of? How is it governed from its principles, its regulations, to its culture, the metrics, the incentives it gives its staff? But then most profoundly, how is it owned? And this comes back to, is it owned by venture capital? Is it owned by its employees? Is it owned by the state? Is it owned by shareholders? Because how it's owned, determines how it's financed and the intent of that finance. And to me, under so much of what we're saying is the intent of finance mm -hmm. determined by ownership. And we need to get down to redesigning that so that we have ownership and finance of enterprise directing phenomenal technologies in pursuit of those sustainable development goals, in pursuit of the Paris Agreement. And until we align that, we're gonna continually see this split, which Jeff so eloquently puts as the game, we sign up to high-minded goals and head off absolutely the other direction because the design of in enterprise is not remotely aligned with achieving that. The, the design of, uh, of these... Maybe I could make I'm one gonna, point I'm if gonna, I... Yes, please. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I just I wanted to uh, point out how modern capitalism started 400-some uh, uh, years ago. Probably the, the first uh, modern capitalist venture was... Uh, by a, uh, an English terrorist, uh, Francis Drake, uh, who uh, was funded to go sink uh, Spanish galleons. 
Uh, and uh, he did in 1587, he uh, captured uh, the Golden Hind. Who was his lead investor? It was Queen Elizabeth. Uh, this was uh, the start of modern capitalism. Uh, the state and the company were intertwined in, in international illegal enterprise. And it worked out so well that 13 years later, the East India Company was established, again with the state guaranteeing uh, the debts of a private company. So this goes back uh, a long time. Back in 1600, though, a royal charter was still an unusual uh, step for a company. Now we have turned the entire economy over to the corporate form. And it is, by design, a limited liability regime, which means break every rule, break every law, lobby us to your heart's content, you have no liability for that if you make money pocketed it. So it's a pretty fundamental design problem. It has its deep roots in uh, this country's glorious history, uh, which invented modern capitalism, uh, but it has become a generalized proposition. We need a strong state representing not the companies themselves, but representing the citizenry to control this. But it doesn't work country by country anymore. Mm. That's why, of course, the tragedy of Brexit is uh, such an absurdity, uh, is, is upon us. Britain by itself means nothing in this world, sorry to tell you. Uh, nor does the United States mean anything by itself. The world's not going to be determined by what happens uh, in the British Isles as might have seemed the case 200 years ago. So there's a little nostalgia at play that is rather shockingly naive uh, in 2019. We have a global stage and we better be cooperating actually globally to control the global behemoths that have been created and that walk the planet and shift money at will to places that protect uh, their uh, bank balances from taxation. And it's rot within the US because that's a big tax haven. It's rot within the European Union because half the European Union is a tax haven or a facilitator of tax havens. And it cannot be solved by any one country or even the EU or the US alone. It's interesting that the G20 began to talk about this uh, a little bit over the weekend. That's something, uh, not much, but it is something. But stop Brexit, stop busting the Europe, and then we need global cooperation in order to honestly address these issues because not one of them is solvable at a national or even a regional level. And stop trying to make a new Cold War with China. That's the US latest brilliant idea. Could not be dumber. Buy Huawei, please. <laughs> it's unbelievable what they're trying to do. They're out of their minds because they think that they can get another century of US primacy, but they're nuts. They're going to create war if we don't stop this. So my point is, this story goes back a long way. Now we need to follow the goals we've set but only by global cooperation to break the privileges, the tax havens, to be able to collect the revenues needed and to avoid conflict. Now, uh, Jeff, I promised you your timekeeper because you have a hard stop. To yep. So should we, do you want to run now? No, one, you'll keep going, you'll keep going. Go I have one, one okay. minute, one or two so minutes. We have 10 yep. minutes left. We're gonna make this a little bit rapid fire. I'm gonna limit people to about 42 seconds. Uh, in responses. We uh, touched on something, we keep coming back to this, which is we have to redesign these systems. The, the, the roadmaps that you've come up with are quite sophisticated. Donuts, missions, arrows, charts. Um, <laughs> those sort of suggest you need technocratic solutions. Um, and yet we are at a time, Bolsonaro, Duterte, Woodby Johnson, Trump, of people who are governing for the emotional needs of the people, not for the, the sort of real and deeper needs. 
how do we get our politics to support the institutional change that the roadmaps are playing out? Maybe if I could ask Mariana, just, and then come to you, Bill. Yeah, so I, I didn't have time to go through the thousand slides I prepared wrongly for an eight minute talk, but one of them was about criteria. So instead of thinking of sort of a top down Kennedy style mission, what's, what's been interesting, for example, in Germany is that their Energiewende mission, which has been about reducing really the material content of the entire manufacturing base in order to move towards a, a, a you know, lower carbon content economy, actually came out of 30 years of a green movement. You know, I mean, basically what Merkel did was, you know, they brought sustainability to the fore and she transformed it into a mission, which then really required transformation across many sectors. So again, it wasn't a handout, it was a transformation. And the tools like the public bank KFW, you know, those tools were conditional on uh, uh, um, sectors like steel to transform themselves. But the fact that it was actually a movement really begs the question, do we even have capabilities inside governments to engage with that kind of conflict and contestation, which, for example, social care movements have today around the world? But also, we shouldn't forget about demand. I mean, you were saying those five design principles. One thing which our colleague Carlotta always reminds us, that without, for example, suburbanization, we would not have had, you know, the mass production revolution would not have had the effect it did across the whole economy. So how to actually both enable this bottom-up you know, experimentation, but also never forget that demand doesn't just happen because people wake up one day wanting to move to the suburbs. That was actually, you know, that came out of policy and that actually facilitates these big changes to actually be, you know, have an effect in terms of cross-sectoral impact. I think it's really critical in the context of any conversation like this to remember how recent and how fragile the coexistence of representative democracy and market capitalism is. Representative democracy emerged in the 19th century as a counterweight to the industrialization of economic life and the mass industrialization of it. It is under enormous stress virtually everywhere in the Western world and much of the Eastern world. The, the digital revolution has enabled, has enabled China to propose an alternative, what I call the, the not-so-benevolent surveillance state, in, unthinkable in the absence of the digital revolution. So before we can even get to the sort of narratives that can mobilize people productively, we need to recognize how serious this threat is and that the leaders that Jeff identified are symptoms, they're symptomatic, of the greatest threat to representative democracy since the 1930s and with similar motivation and we may hope not similar consequences. So, Kate, you're the catalyst of the movement. Uh, are you finding governments are engaging with you to help rethink their policies in the ways that Mariana has described? Yes, I've been amazed actually by the number of governments. Uh, cause the, when I wrote Journal Economics, seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. I went for the long view and I intentionally did not try to make it palatable, excessive, pragmatic and implementable for 2020. And I've been amazed by the number of governments that actually have said, we want this. And across the political spectrum, whether here in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, I was just in New Zealand where the Minister of Finance said, we want to create a donut economy here in New Zealand. There is a hunger amongst politicians, amongst civil servants for vision of something, and then you said, okay, these, these visions, whether it's a donut or a mission, these are complex, I would actually counter the opposite. I think they are irresistibly and compellingly clear. We want a, a thriving planet and human flourishing for all. People get that. They get that within the context of their own community and in the world, and it's not easy to get there, but people understand that. And it, I think politicians are desperate to break out of this endless kind of focus on growth everything and talk about people again and talk about a thriving economy. So they are looking for a new language and, and the only place I think they'll get the chance to speak it is when there's enough of a constituency that represents it. I'm working with cities that say we want to use these ideas to transform our city here in London, in Amsterdam, in the US. We're working with community groups, working with companies, with banks got to build a constituency that wants that transformation, holds that vision, and politicians can then step there because they know there are people who already share that view. Thank you. Now, as an entrepreneur, one of the things I've had to do is focus. Out of all the hundreds of things I can do, you can only choose to do one. Now, we've heard a lot of tension here. We've got the, the SDGs, there are many of them. Kate, you've talked about the regenerative economy and the distributive 
uh, economy. Let's play some hardball here. If you had to prioritize one, wealth distribution or sustainability in the next five or seven years, which one would it be? I'm going to start with you, Jeff, because I know you have to get off the Yeah, train. I have to go, uh, but you don't, you don't have to prioritize, so false choice. Oh, Thanks. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you for making Jeff, I'll, follow, I'll finish up for you. lose. The whole point about wealth distribution and sustainability is that it can be reconciled. That is why I think the language of the Green New Deal has such resonance. I think it was an, it's a brand, it's not a plan. The plan when developed, as and when it's developed, is going to be, again, contradictory and inconsistent. But the notion that there is some way to achieve the long-term goals by, in the short run, empowering people and, in fact, paying them. You imagine the number of jobs to be created by reducing the wasted heat coming out of houses mm -hmm. and, of course, putting those solar panels on. The tools are there. It is the narrative that we need. And I think we're beginning to see that narrative emerge in the U.S. And that's the most encouraging thing since 2016 that I've been able to take note of. Mariana, can we have both? I, I think it's a really dangerous question. I mean, I actually think it's why many kind of center-left parties and movements are kind of failing to win the narrative. If you just talk about redistribution, what are you redistributing? If you can't debunk the fact that actually where lots of this wealth comes from was actually an outcome of a social collective process, and then what does it mean to really fortify those collective processes, then it's, and, and also just, it's not very interesting, it's not dynamic. I mean, when Obama had his um, Affordable Care Act and he was accused by the Tea Party for meddling in you know, people's health care, his response was the classic social democratic response, which is this is the right thing to do because otherwise, you know, 60 uh, um, uninsured, uh, sorry, 60 million uninsured people won't get, you know, access to health care. He should have said, meddling? What are you talking about? We actually created 75% of the drugs inside the healthcare system. So of course we have the right to redistribute that in ways that actually reflect that collective uh, risk-taking process. And unless we do that, again, this, the, this power dynamic will not get debunked. And it's not a coincidence, I think, that the you know, big tech giants are supporting UBI. I'm not against UBI, I actually think it's a good idea, but the narrative behind it is, you know, we're creating wealth and then we'll give a handout. So the universal basic dividend or the citizen's share is already something very different in terms of the narrative. You are redistributing wealth that actually was fundamentally co-created by different types of actors, not just the wealth creators in Silicon Valley. So. I, I leave behind words because they actually fail us sometimes, and that's why I think the power of image is so strong. If I do this, that is what we're trying to create, a regenerative distributive dynamic. And nature's been doing it for 3.8 billion years. That's why there are so many species flourishing together in ecosystems. They regenerate and they distribute, and trees share energy under their roots, and mycorrhizomes work magic under the soil. We need to learn to mimic this in our economies. It's, so, it's, in this, it's in the COGX image. You know, we already recognize that this is the beautiful pattern of the 21st century. And we've got to leave behind the divisive and de degenerative patterns of the 20th. So we cannot do one without the other. And nature proves it. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time uh, with this panel. If you do want to follow up with the speakers, I think we have a, a meet the speakers. There's a yellow thingy paddle over there. Um, you could even go deeper. I've spoken to each one of our four panelists on my podcast. So if you just pop in their names, my name, and the word podcast in your search engine of choice, you will be able to find a one hour long uh, conversation where we dig into some of these details. Uh, and one last pitch for economics uh, on the cutting edge stage. On Wednesday morning, we have a really incredible panel with Eric Beinhocker, Thor Greipel, and Cesar Hidalgo, where we are looking at the area, the intersection of complexity economics, artificial intelligence, and knowledge formation. Highly accessible technical topic. Please come and join us there. Um, and last but not least, please thank you to our amazing panelists. <laughs>